Well, hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be your host this evening. I have a, a guest that I'm very privileged to have uh, on today's show. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Gabriel Nell. Uh, Gabriel is one of our core contributors uh, at Exorcism. Uh, he's been involved very much in the Go track specifically, but I'll let him introduce himself uh, in more detail shortly. But just to say, Gabriel, it's great to have you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope that you have just as much fun as all the listeners on today's show. So, Gabriel, why don't you take it away? Tell me a little bit, um, where are you from and how did you end up at where you are currently? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Gabriel. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm from South Germany. That's where I grew up. And that's where I'm now. Not the same place, but still South mm -hmm. Germany. Um, yeah, I grew up in, so I, let's start at, I'm, I'm an early 80s person. Cool. So I grew up, uh, I was born in 81. And um, I think where I'm coming from is, um, so uh, around late, late 80s, um, my father brought home his, our first computer. So I think that's where, where the story begins. Uh, nice. This is the tech story. Yeah. Um, it had MS DOS on. I, I'm not sure exactly uh, what version it was. Um, I think it was an older version also because, as if I remember correctly, my father brought it home because it was basically thrown out at his company and they got new computers. Mm -hmm. So he took, he was able to take that one home. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what was my first uh, impression of, of computers. MS DOS, interesting, uh, strange. Is that where just the, um, the 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 lines, the colored lines on the black screen? Is that pretty much yeah, it was just everything white that you and could black, see? Yeah, yeah, basically, and uh, <laughs> okay. you could basically mostly it was just the command line which I got to know first, and then I uh, yeah. with uh, for later my father basically in eight in ninety around ninety ninety one my father mm -hmm. taught us. Um, our first for loops in QBASIC. I uh, was uh, okay. 10 around the time. And then there was uh, also learning vocabularies. So, so my father bought a program for learning vocabularies and it was MS-DOS based. And um, I think you had a mouse to click, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe it was later. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So it was it was definitely those times uh, when I first started to do computers stuff and I broke it a few times. My father had to fix it a few <laughs> times. So I was definitely interested in, in learning about mm -hmm. this, not really in a way that I sat down and said to myself, I need to learn about this. Why well, I, yeah. I was really interested in, in understanding what you could do with it. And it intrigued me. And, and was um, your was your father? Did he um, did he work in computers specifically, or was he just in in business and it happened to bring a computer home, or was there a specific reason that he brought it home mm -hmm. for computer reasons or technical reasons? Yeah, he um, actually he is a, an electrician by by trade. What he learned, mm -hmm. um, but he was working at Bosch at the time, and he was working mm -hmm. in the electronics department where they did the development of. Um, of new chips uh, or new stuff for, for cars. And there they, of course, also had computers. And he was actually responsible pretty early for for kind of everything around computers, network, um, uh, printers, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So that's okay. basically, he, he, he got into it. He was basically the one who did everything around okay. to make, make things work there. Uh, and because he didn't have a doctor's degree as most of the others in his department. Um, so he was basically taking care of these kinds of things. And he learned, uh, he learned a lot about these things, about computers. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just jumped, jumped in there. So you were saying then you were playing around, uh, you broke it a few times mm. and that was kind of your introduction to, to computers and hardware and all of that kind of stuff. So then, what what happened then f from that point onwards? What was the progression? So I think the next big step was I, I got my own computer. That was, I would say, mm -hmm. five or six days later when I was uh, a young 
adult um, and I was interested in, in in computers more and more and also had some some parts in, in school. I started to write my homework on computers and all that kind of stuff. So, and that's already Windows time. So uh, Word mm -hmm. and MS Word and, and those those ages. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say it started one day. My computer, my father was always doing some um, literature work for our mm -hmm. church. So we, we grew up in a very small church and um, we had this literature, um, which we were basically using. And my father was kind of uh, digitalizing or helping digitalize that literature. The beginning okay. was kind of a side project and later um, on it, uh, it became actually my first full-time job and working for the, huh. for the, um, well, let me quickly look at that word. Working for the publisher in the US, which were, who okay. that was responsible for, for the, that literature. And mm -hmm. um, basically, my father asked me, yeah, I have all these um, macros. Um, I have written them in Euroscript. That was basically a MS-DOS based uh, um, version of Word, you could say. So mm -hmm. pre-Word. And I want to switch to Word now, and I need all my macros in Word. And I kind of <laughs> said, OK, yeah. OK. And that's how I started uh, programming in Word. So Visual Basic for application. You could record the macros first, you could look at the code and you could see what it's doing and you could improve it and basically improve the macros so much that they were able to to basically, before it was like you put the cursor here and then you press a key and then it does something, like in the next few lines and in the end mm -hmm. it was like it would process the entire Word document from top to bottom completely automated. <laughs> and wow. um, basically, that was the entrance to a lot of macros I wrote for that because uh, that kind mm -hmm. of made, created some big waves. And, uh, and the, the person, the people that gave my father these kind of tasks to do in his uh, free mm -hmm. time, they said, "Wow, this is great! Let's do more and more and more and automate this more and more." Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that's wow. how so I you got basically into... saved him. You, you saved your dad a, a lot of time. Uh, in life, yeah. <laughs> in that sense, <laughs> yeah. at a young age. I could say that. <laughs> so wow. the, the well, macro that's, that's writing in Word, later in Excel, I wrote an Excel-based, um, um, uh, what do you, a shop system for a small um, mm -hmm. shop. So it was a, um, yeah, it was a small shop for organic foods and so on. And they, they basically, they, they, they wrote down all the prices and then they calculated them in their head or on paper. And that's how that worked in the mm -hmm. beginning. And I wrote a system for that with barcode scanning and with a scale where you could put away something and you could get the receipt and then scan that when you go to the for wow. to pay and all that kind of so basically all around that it was excel based so it kind of was mm -hmm. um yeah i would i would definitely do it differently so there was excel was kind of the database at the same time as also the the printing machine mm -hmm. so i would format everything in excel in an excel sheet and then it would be printed on the on the receipt printer all those kinds of things um of course um yeah so that was uh, the beginning of, of, the, of my career. So and and how, how old were you when you when you did all of that? And, and, and what then led on from from there? Was it before university, mm -hmm. sort of during high school? And then kind of did that inform your career path, so to speak, quite significantly? Yeah, that was uh, all before university. So the, the system for the shop was when I was around mm -hmm. 20, 21, I did my civil service around the time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the macro writing was when I was like 16. In between, I also wrote uh, some access based uh, system for for um, mm -hmm. printing um, labels for letters. So you, they could be sent out yep. uh, address addresses and so on. Um, and then I came studying and uh, surprise, surprise, I did not study informatics. 
So okay. I actually studied to be a math mathematics and German teacher for for ages. Okay. Wow. Um, ages. Let me calculate that. Uh, ages ten to um, twenty and nineteen. So those are the ages. Okay. Uh, so fifth. So, so you went down the, the teaching career path. Was your was yeah. the way you started heading? Yeah. And and what was that? What was that? decision based on sort of like hmm. um actually i i probably would have gone down the road maybe often of of programming um but uh, during my civil service i i learned there's a lot more than just technical stuff i, I would hmm. say yeah. and that um so i was uh, responsible or was uh, um in a, in a small team that was responsible for an elderly mm -hmm. home, you could say. There were like five, mm -hmm. five, six rooms in there and there were different people. And I was responsible mostly for one, um, she was um, maybe 55, 60, and she had Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. um, that had a big impression on me because, um, yeah, if you're confronted mm. at that age with that kind of, um, mm. I mean, it, it, you could say, yeah, she was 60 and it sounded old for a 20 year old, but it was still clear to me that this could happen to, to anyone. It could yeah. also happen to me. And, um, that made me much more interested in the social areas of, of life and, and, uh, and the social career paths. And that's where actually, um, that's basically the reason why I chose to be a teacher at the time. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go. I was very good at, at teaching or helping my co-students mm -hmm. uh, at, uh, especially at school and mathematics. Was, mathematics was my, my strongest area. And uh, I always liked it. Yeah, I always liked it to, to help others to, to improve their, their skills or to, I always loved it when they when they suddenly understood it when when I saw in their eyes mm -hmm. now how they got it yeah mm -hmm. and so I oh, that's cool I actually became a teacher yeah. oh that's cool and just tell me like um, you mentioned this thing like civil your civil service so to speak is that mm -hmm. something in Germany which is a mandatory period that every um, student or child needs to do before they go to university how do, how does that all fit in to German culture or German, your nation? Hmm. It was back then um, alternative, an alternative to going to the military. So either okay. you did nine, nine months military or you did 11 months civil service. That was the okay. requirement okay. for men, so not for women. Is that still the, is that still the case um, in Germany? No, I, don't, it doesn't, case I don't think anymore. it is the case. Though. No, no. Okay. I know it is in Switzerland, which is where my wife comes from. So it's just interesting mm -hmm. that yeah, um, that setup is still is still prevalent. Okay, so now you, you did maths and you studied to be a teacher, and obviously programming played a part in your life in quite a significant way. When did it kind of? So you, did you have a moment where you like actually, I'm I'm in teaching, I'm enjoying this, but I'm not. But there's still this programming piece that is active and and engaged. Like, how did how did those two things balance out the teaching and the programming? So how did I get back to programming? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, so during my during my time when I was studying, there were basically two things I did as side jobs. The one was teaching. I was teaching at a, a tutoring agency. Um, I was teaching at the, at the university, uh, the younger, so in mathematics mostly in um, the first and second mm -hmm. semesters. And at the same time, I had a job uh, at a company, um, a tech company. They were mostly, uh, so it was mostly access based. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a company that did uh, hardware and software for car sharing and and companies who had a lot of cars, they would rent to their um, to okay. their employees. And 
Yeah, there I basically started as a document writer first, and then they figured out I can program too. So okay. I quickly moved into the programming uh, area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then um, I would say things changed mostly when um, during the last uh, parts of the, which were parts of the study uh, that you had to go, you were was required to have six weeks in the school and mm -hmm. and one and once uh, four weeks and so on and i think it became clear and clearer and clearer to me also to by talking to very experienced and very um um very um teachers that were really um uh, dedicated very dedicated mm. teachers um that basically the, the, the times have changed a lot. The students have mm -hmm. changed a lot. You know, one teacher, she said to me, she was always uh, uh, teaching fifth and sixth grade. And she was mm -hmm. basically telling me, well, five years ago, I had one student in my class. that was a problem child, problem child in the sense mm -hmm. that the family was not complete. Um, there, there was divorce or there were problems at home and so on and so on. Um, um, and now she has more than 50%. Sure. And that was oh. 10 or 15 years ago, um, 2006 mm. or seven, that must have been, so it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that showed how much things have changed. And it was also very clear to me that many students nowadays they just don't want to learn anymore and the teacher yeah. is always the basically the teacher is always the last uh, the, the tail of the whole yeah. you know the parents and the, the headmaster and uh, the, the, the students they're basically all the masters of the mm -hmm. teacher yeah the teacher is always the mm -hmm. one of the the last straw you could say or the yeah I'm not sure how you would express it in english yeah. he is always the one that has to Bears all the responsibility, but has no no rights, basically. No authority to no. to yeah to act. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So did and, that then shape your decision? Oh, well, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Keep yeah, keep that going. kind of that kind of at least it got me thinking a lot. And um, after I was done with uh, university, I kind of just uh, sl slid back into. Mm -hmm. into programming because a friend of mine, he, uh, the one who gave me my, my father, uh, this, this literature work, um, he, um, he basically asked me if I could help him with a project, and that project, which okay. first was considered to be like a four or six weeks project turned into a two and a half or three and a half years, a three and a half years project. Scope, so scope creep. The scope creep was real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, first he asked me to do to help him with something, um, and then the, he was always in contact with a person from this publisher in the U.S. And the publisher always said, "I want a public homepage for this weird literature. I want people to read the entire books online." And oh, wow. Well, I said, uh, at, at one point, I just said to my friend, he was talking to him on the phone, and he said, well, I could imagine doing that. I don't really have something to do right now. So, and he said, oh, Gabriel does it. And that was how it started. So wow. I wow. had a project, uh, yeah, and then I worked three and a half years for that project, um, bringing, bringing thousands of books online, the entire content, researchable, wow. indexed, um, different languages connected to each other. Um, yeah, the website is wow. still online. It's uh, eg, egwwritings.org. So if anyone mm -hmm. is interested in looking at that, uh, it has a new design now. I saw uh, around December last year, they switched the design, but the code underneath is still all the same. Mostly it's mine. Because I can see because it was mostly JavaScript based. Um, and yeah. the code looks very much, it's organized differently, the files and so are differently, but the style is still the same. Mm -hmm. You'll have to post, um, send me the link and we'll, we'll post it in the show notes uh, mm -hmm. at, at the right time. But 
So now you, you did three and a half years, well, three years of this project. Um, you've put, you've indexed all of this stuff. Were you using JavaScript as your main language at that point? Um, what was your, what was your sort of technical setup? You could say, uh, what were you mm -hmm. focusing in language wise? So that was basically the big step from switching away from windows based software, which was before mm -hmm. visual basic and visual basic.net. And now it was only a jQuery, JavaScript, and PHP in the background. Okay. Um, we also had an agreement that um, whenever I did, I did research, I had a, a lower hourly rate, um, which mm -hmm. was a third of when I was actually doing programming. And yeah, that, okay. that gave me the freedom to basically learn on the on the job and, and uh -huh. uh, yeah. Cool. So then, um, where where does exorcism and now you you do a lot of Go? Am I right in, in saying like mm -hmm. Go is kind of a main feature of what you do? You mentor a lot, and you've been well, you've been involved with exorcism in in Go and kind of helping that side of things. When when did that start coming into the picture, and and why was it of interest to you? Um, go for it. Yeah, uh, in 2016, that was uh, my first job after that um, mm -hmm. that big project. Um, um, actually, towards the end of that, I started to to switch to Go. I did some PHP and Python at that job mostly, and um, that became very quickly my favorite language. My favorite language because it. Um, because it has that simplicity, it, it's basically trying to go back from that crazy world of more and more features and languages and making them more and more mm -hmm. complex and complicated and oh, a lot more overhead for the for the developer, because he has to choose which way to do it. And he has to mm. also understand all the, the other ways other people do it. So all this overhead, mm. um, and go suddenly it just brought in this quietness and this this um, the simplicity again, and um, that mm. very quickly became my number one language. Um, I was building a, a prototype in that company like half a year half a year before I left because they wanted to switch to go. Mm. And um, at the beginning, of course, there were these initial things where you stumble over things which you can't do in the language and Mm -hmm, you understand mm -hmm. why it doesn't make sense to do it that way or why it's better to do it the other way. And that I was really interested in, in learning how to do these things. Mm. And um, that's how I started to listen to the Go Time podcast. Um, okay. That's from, um, from Changelog. Um, okay. And Katrina Owen was on that podcast, I think, twice. At least twice I heard from her, I think. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's how I started to look into it. I think in 2017, I re registered on on Xerxism. I'm not 100% sure. I would have to look it up. Probably and, version um, 2, I imagine. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think would it might have it? even been the version 1 still, because in the beginning, there was mm -hmm. no... Um, there was kind of... I didn't get really... Uh, I didn't get any feedback. I did a few exercises, but I never got feedback. <laughs> and I was able to give others feedback, and I did. And but yeah. I, I never got feedback, so there was no no process in place to to really get get some feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was kind of if you want to, and if you don't, um, just leave it. So so to say, yeah. I yeah. think that was version one, right? I imagine so. I mean, I think. Uh... Mm. It's been quite a lot of shift from version one to version three. Um, yeah, it was kind yeah. of, I think version one was little feedback. Version two was extreme amounts of feedback required. And then version three is kind of sat somewhere in the mm. middle a little bit, um, maybe on the, on the lesser side of things. But um, no, and, and did you, did you in, were you involved in building out version three? And how did, how did you kind of, um, yeah, what was your involvement there? I mean, I, I'm not fully clear on that, but um, mm -hmm. would love to understand. Um, maybe one one step back, if I may, if I may. Um, mm. So, 
basically I came back after the second uh, interview I heard from Katrina on on the exorcism okay. um, that's when version 2 existed and when mm -hmm. there was a lot of work and there was this pipeline with lots of feedback needed and I jumped mm -hmm. into that and I really liked giving that feedback and uh, mm -hmm. I, I basically I started to think about um, how I could uh, make this faster yeah because i realized quickly that mm -hmm. especially on the first exercises it was clear that i would give the same answer again and again and again mm -hmm. and again yeah and uh, on the other hand of course sometimes there were these two issues and sometimes there was this issue and another one so i basically mm -hmm. started to automate this i started to to write a low go program uh, which used static analysis because I wanted to get into static analysis. I hadn't done that before. Yeah. I wanted to get to know this, so I kind of was interested in trying that anyway, and that seemed like a good fit because it was still mm -hmm. code that was very common or very similar all the time. The solutions of mm -hmm. the Nexus, especially the first ones, is, is very similar. So well, that's how I got into static analysis and I just uh, looked for different patterns in the code and then automatically added answer blocks, or predefined blocks to the answer. And okay. uh, basically I started that locally and uh, that's how I was able to do around 100 a week, 100 <laughs> tutorings wow. a week. Yeah, um, and I wasn't even doing anything full time. It was beside my job, and so yeah. And then um, it, it kind of started to to Bitfield. I think was the first one. John mm -hmm. Arundel, I think, mm -hmm. is his real name. Uh, he was like the yeah. first one saying, "Whoa, this is great! This is super!" And uh, uh, so that's how it basically started to get known. Um, the, the the work I did and. Uh, with the static analysis and I think that was a big part then of the version 3 because um, we started to think mm -hmm. about how we can how we can basically reduce the work of a tutor by having these tools these automatic uh, these uh, static analysis or the tools that mm -hmm. basically check the code automatically and give feedback automatically um, mm -hmm even completely automatically without a mentor even being involved or having to be involved and because the mentors it was quite clear that we have mentors and they are not enough for the work we had the inversion to mm -hmm. and um we also saw that many mentors were burning out it was just they disappeared mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. yeah it was just too much too much on on many mentors yeah the, the work with mm. some, some language tracks they had like 500 or more uh, solutions to be mentored or, and mm. sometimes there were like wait times for one month or more and um, crazy, of course yeah. those were those were conditions where also the students would just leave at some point yeah mm -hmm. it's funny because um i think jeremy was saying the other day that um out of all of all of the solutions that get submitted, something like 75% of them are fully unique, which is which I find also fascinating. I mean, you go to like a Hello World exercise, obviously it's very simple, but surely that, that's got like a standard pattern that gets implemented regularly. <laughs> and he was like, no, it's um, people try all sorts of different different things. And it's funny how... Mm -hmm you know, that, that crossover between, um, because as coding becomes more popular and as more people take up developing and programming, you, you kind of wonder, well, where's that automation going to start? Like nullifying the role of the developer. I, I wonder, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it will. Um, I think there's still too much thinking required, but in terms of, you know, I don't know what your thoughts are around that, but it does feel like with exorcism lately, there's a huge push for mentoring that is automated, which is really fascinating because, it, like you said, it, it, it takes all of those re repetitive 
um, lessons that you ha keep having to give and, and puts them in a way that is manageable for people to kind of ma manage. Mm. But at the same time, w where does it cross over into being actually you need the, a human interaction, a human to really engage with the content. So I, I don't know if you have any ideas around that, but I, f I find it that's an interesting space at this point. Yeah, I don't think that uh, developers will be replaced very soon. That will be a uh, quite a long time mm -hmm. still. Uh, I mean, in development uh, applications in general, um, in mentoring, mm -hmm. I think um, I think the static analysis and uh, and also the the automated mentoring and, and uh, automated mentoring in general um, on exorcism can be a big help. But the mentors mm -hmm. are needed for for the real mentoring, I would say. Yeah. Um, for example, mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. a, I have a, a, someone I'm mentoring. Uh, like every two or three months, we have like a call. Sometimes more often, and I'm mentoring That's them cool. in their career, so to say. Yeah, and also technically, mm -hmm. very deeply technical. And, but it's uh, that's a completely different mentoring than just looking at the solution and telling you what you mm -hmm. can improve. And I think that's what, what mm -hmm. the mentors on exorcism are still needed for and and are def mm -hmm. definitely will be needed for. In the, and, and I think that's something we can focus on. Um, on the other hand, mm -hmm. um, I think um, I think we, we can't replace the mentors completely on all the solutions and I don't think we should. Mm -hmm. Um, we can automate a lot of things, um, but still a mentor is someone who can who can point the direction. Yeah, they can see the problems you're mm -hmm. struggling with. And they can tell you, you need to understand this and this, not just you need to improve your code mm -hmm. in this way. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I would like to have more mentoring back on exorcism. Yeah. So I'm kind of wondering more, if we should... Kind of face to face type uh, interaction you, you mean yeah i'm kind of wondering if we um if we should so we had this this pathway before of 10 exercises and go at mm -hmm. least it was 10 i think which you had mm -hmm. to go through and you could only proceed when it was mentored yeah and i mm -hmm. think with the automation we have in place now we could actually switch that back on again or mm -hmm. maybe not now but in future and I think I would, I would like something, that. something we could definitely, we should bring up in a, in a community call. Cause I think mm. that would be, uh, that would be cool to sort of bring, bring that back into, into, into focus. So Gabriel, one of the questions that we often ask, and, and this is not the one that I talked to you earlier, but I, one of the questions I, I, I enjoy asking, cause it's always very interesting and different is when did programming kind of click for you? Um, some people would say that there was an experience of suddenly everything made sense. So I, I use the story often for me was, <clears throat> I give an example of school when I was learning chemistry. And uh, in the UK where I was at school, you have these exams at 16. And so everything leads up to those exams for three years prior to those exams. So you have three years of study and that culminates in your final um, exam. And that's across all of the subjects. And uh, one of the topics obviously was chemistry. And I spent about three years not having a clue about chemistry. I just couldn't, it couldn't, it didn't, I couldn't understand it. But then a week before the exam, it was like the penny just dropped the expression of like, the thing just made sense. And I was like, Oh my word, I can get everything from the periodic table. If I use the, the numbers in the periodic table, I can understand this, that, and that. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing became really simple. And it was like instant. Did you have a moment like that for programming or was it something that just kind of you found naturally made sense to you? And when was that moment, if that's relevant? I'm not sure if I have that, um, that definite moment. Um, so I think it, it helped a lot to have that macro recording and um, just mm -hmm. looking at the code very early uh, with Visual Basic for application. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's still, so, if still something like that is around today, I think you can still pick up yeah. word and uh, do that. Um, but that's mm. not very often that you have something like this, that where you can record and then look at the code and learn that way. 
I think that made it a lot easier mm -hmm. for me because uh, I was struggling a lot uh, in that in the beginning. Um, I think uh, one one kind of moment where I would say, okay, um, not that I understood things, but that, that I realized um, basically if I'm actually doing things right or wrong was when mm -hmm. I joined that company when I was a student was basically the first time that work, I worked together with other developers before that I was always mm -hmm. just on my own and I had to basically do everything and it was always a big question. Do you usually do it that way? It, it's, it feels strange. It feels <laughs> complicated. It feels, yeah. it, it works, but is it correct? I mean, and mm -hmm. that kind of got answered when I, when I joined that company and starting to go there. Mm -hmm. And um, definitely there was a lot I needed to learn and I did learn a lot. For example, access record sets, I never really understood them before I kind of worked with them, but Mm, yeah, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but yeah, then I really, worked, yeah. I really understood, I started to understand them. So that was can, maybe something that clicked for me because mm. so I had a coworker and she explained it to me and it was really, mm. it, it, it made click yeah, and suddenly I understood how they are working and uh, mm -hmm. how mm. to, how, how they're meant to work and how to use them correctly and so on. So yeah, maybe that was one of no, those cool. points, but I think you, those points, they, they come in our jobs very often. Maybe, I don't think there's that one point, maybe that's one, that one initial point, but, um, also for Go, there are so many places where it made click to for me, uh, where I understood why something is that way and how it's supposed to be used. And, um, for Can example, you have, context. Do you have an example of mm -hmm. Yeah, do yeah, you for have an example, example context. Like... Yeah. Yeah, the, for example, the context in Go, um, uh, they were added in, I'm not sure, 1.6 or 7, maybe, uh, around that time, I guess. And I didn't really look at them, to be honest. I didn't really need think I needed them in the beginning. And then mm -hmm. I got went to one, uh, um, to one, uh, there was like a meetup and, and somebody presented about the context, how you use them, how, how you, and so on. And I thought mm -hmm. I should look at them, but it still took a <laughs> few months until I really looked at them and, and yeah. I understood why they are there. And, um, for example, the, the close channel, I'm not sure if you're aware of many people, they, they still propose on the internet that you close a girl team with a close channel. And you okay. shouldn't. That's what the context is for. Yeah, you use a context, you cancel the context, and then, and then you can close the go routine with that. If you use a go a closed channel, it's basically you, you you're doing manually what a context does internally, and there's so many footprints to avoid, so many problems <laughs> to avoid I, that I'm usually sure that you, people I'm do sure it wrong. Yeah, I, I'm sure you had a live. You did a live stream, and you mentioned something about that. I, I do. I think I do recall where yeah. you mentioned, uh, you know, just use the <laughs> context um, because it's something yeah, yeah. that that makes a lot of yeah. sense. Um, I, remember, I mentioned sure that. that. Yeah, but um, no. So, so in, in terms then of like when you've mentored people uh, in the past, like what are some of the? Can you identify key? actions or behaviors or things that the people who grasp stuff well and quickly, can you identify like what they do that allows them to kind of position themselves to learn quickly or more effectively? Or is it a lot of the mentors that, or people that you've mentored, they kind of just naturally are engaged in that way? Or are there people that you are like, wow, they do stuff, they do things that allows them to accelerate their learning? I'm not sure if I can say that about other people. I can definitely say it uh, about myself. So mm -hmm. I learned, uh, I think from my parents, um, they taught themselves a lot of things. And um, mm -hmm. that's what I also learned from them um, to teach myself things. So programming, I learned completely on my own. Uh, I, well, there was my father in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There was some things in school 
Um, most mm -hmm. of the in, in, in the later uh, classes in school, I was actually, or we were almost all of us were better than the teacher anyway. So there was not really <laughs> learning. There was a kind of learning from each other more. But in, yeah. in general, I, I learned everything by myself. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, that is something I think you need in, in programming because you constantly need mm -hmm. to dig into things you have not seen before, uh, you don't know about, you need to read up on them. So this, this, um, this, uh, what's the word, um, this ability, yeah, this ability or this, mm -hmm. this ability to be able to dig into something and learn it by yourself. I think that's key in programming for, for, for learning. Mm -hmm. And of course you can learn a lot faster if you find somebody that tells you about that. So I don't want to say that you shouldn't look for a mentor, mm -hmm. you shouldn't go mm -hmm. to exorcism and so on and so on. That helps you to grow a lot faster, but still that mm -hmm. is key. That's what I would it's, say. It strikes me that your learning came through practically trying to solve problems. So whether it was making the macros to make trans or whatever you were doing more efficient, or it's, it strikes me that that was like a core theme that repeat has repeated in, in, in your life in terms of, of learning, which I think is probably aligns a lot with, you know, g generally what exorcism is also trying to do in terms of helping people practically do stuff, um, yep, to learn. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. So, so Gabriel, we, we haven't got too much longer left, but I have two final questions. Well, not questions for you. One is a question, uh, and, and I'm going to ask you to share an opinion of yours. And then the other one will be, well, it's kind of an opinion you could say, but I'm going to ask you to give a recommendation to the community for something they need to try, uh, this week. But the first thing, uh, and we've spoken to a lot of our, uh, previous people that we've interviewed and if you've listened to this podcast or this live stream for any length of time you'll know that we ask one big question normally towards the end of, of of our live stream and the question is what is the hill that you would die on in tech so what is the one opinion that you hold very firmly um, that you would be prepared to stand and and defend and bear in mind you have to give good reason for this you can't just be like this is my opinion and that's it. Uh, you have to be able to, to defend yourself in that sense. But um, what would be that opinion? If, and it can be as, as, uh, as full on or as intense or as trivial uh, as, as you like. So w what would that be? Uh, I'd say it with a, a proverb we have in Go or somebody has said in the Go community and that is boring code is better than clever code. <laughs> I like that. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Yeah, basically, it's it's uh, it's uh, it summarizes a big part of course for the philosophy around simplicity, readability. Mm -hmm. So if if in Go you see code and you think, "Wow, that's clever," that's actually bad code. Even if the <laughs> if the coder who did that was was very intelligent and. Uh, and uh, did it in a very clever way. And uh, um, sometimes I feel like in Go, uh, if you really follow the simplicity and the idioms mm -hmm. of Go, um, mm -hmm. you don't really have code in your entire code base, which you want to point to, or you can point to and say, look at that code, how good it is. Because mm -hmm. all your code is actually boring and very simple. And everybody who will look at your code will say, What's so special about it? Yeah. But the point is yeah. you got to the simplicity because you're a good programmer and it's an iteration process and complicated mm -hmm. code, writing complicated code is very easy. Writing mm -hmm. simple code is hard because you still, you first need to make the problem simple in your mind and then you make, need to write the code correct and then you need to iterate it and make it simple. Mm -hmm. And that is a lot longer process and needs a lot better developers than just writing complicated code, mm -hmm. which when you look at it, it's hard to understand, it's hard to read, and it's hard to maintain, and it's hard to change. Mm. 
it's the it's this constant thing of trade offs, isn't it? Um, so I'm I'm fairly young in the tech space, maybe three years, and I haven't come from a developing perspective. I've come from a product, more like the product side of things, the more mm -hmm. the businessy perspective on that. And if you could you could say, and uh, one of the things that was really interesting was it became more and more apparent that it's all about trade offs. So, like you say, it's like the trade off is simp simple code versus complicated code. Whereas complicated code might just be more cumbersome and tricky down the line, but simple code might take longer and, and require more energy and effort up front. And that's the trade off that is consistently being, being made. Um, so that was one of the, I don't know if what, what your thoughts are on that, but it does strike me that that I really like that simplicity side of things. Cause I remember um, my mom had a, had a friend at university and he only ever wrote an essay for his assignments that were two pages long because he was able to condense everything, his whole argument into two pages and he got top marks for it. So, um, I think it, it, it lines up with the whole concept of, of simplicity, which I think is, it's really hard to write simple code because it requires clear, clear thinking, um, not just, just coding. So I think that's a, that's a worthy hill. <laughs> and I think you've iterated that, uh, you've, you've spoken on that really well. Cool. So Gabriel, final question of, of this week. And now you get to give a bit of advice to the exorcism community and it can be anything. It can be, health advice, dietary advice. This is your opportunity to share a piece of advice that you would give to the community and it can be anything that you want. So uh, what would be your recommendation to the, the exorcism community uh, this, this week? What one thing do they need to try or do um, from your perspective? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, okay, now that you say it can be anything, um, well, may I give you two things? <laughs> Yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you do two recommendations. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So, um, one rec one recommendation. So, I'm actually a vegetarian. I grew up vegetarian. I've never yeah. eaten meat, and I actually grew wow. up vegan most of the most most of my childhood and youth. So, try one week without any dairy projects, and so that would be one. So, vegan, and um. Another uh, recommendation would be um, that's that's. I'm not sure if you can do it in one week, but if you're a good developer, you can. Um, a very interesting and very worthwhile to get into. Um, try to build a shared memory, be shared between multiple services, same service, mm -hmm. shared memory. Try to implement a shared memory using the Raft protocol. Okay. You can use a library. You don't need to implement Raft itself, but a Raft it. library. Okay, you'll need to give me. You'll need to send me the link so I can post mm -hmm. that down. So that's Gabriel's. Ch oh, we, maybe we should call it Gabriel's challenge for the week. <laughs> maybe not so much recommendation. Maybe we need to make yeah, this a thing, like which a is challenge or something to try. Every week, you send you send out a challenge. That could be that could be good fun. But um, cool. So a week of no meat products at all. See how that goes. And uh, and build a shared memory server system. What would you say? Service shared memory okay. service. Call it the in-memory key value database. Okay. So multiple services, one database or one server. Cool. Yeah. Cool. That's because great. Because it, 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 it teaches you a lot about how how databases work. Yeah, underneath. Mm -hmm. So especially the modern ones, which are shared, like. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, like uh, Cassandra slash Skyla. I'm not sure if you heard of Skyla. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a Cassandra clone, but in C++. And they're switching to the Raft protocol now. Um, or the, um, there's a key value database, a shared one. Is it D-base? No, it's not D-base. Um, Return go um, 
account for that one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Badger, Dgraph from Dgraph, Badger. Um, so that one, I think it will also use Raft under the hood to, to distribute the yeah. data. I can't say for sure. I would have to look it up again, but um, there are many databases we use, that use it under the hood and um, distributed system. So distributed system is basically a big challenge, I would say, of our modern times. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's we are in the process of solving that, but there are still many challenges to 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 overcome. And yeah, it's always good to be able to to. To think in that in that regard, because if mm. you can, then it opens a lot of possibilities. Mm. If you if you need them. In my last company, I was actually going down that road, having a shared memory okay. between multiple services of the same type. Yeah. Maybe maybe we need to line this up as a, a masterclass. We'll give people a couple of weeks <laughs> to give it a go, and then yeah, Gabriel, we uh, can we can do another master. masterclass. <laughs> Yeah, then you're yeah, done with exactly, exercises exactly. and, and you've done all the exercises done. That's the big one. The big <laughs> one. It ties it all. It ties everything all together. Well, Gabriel, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to chat to you this evening. Um, if you want to just stay on after, the, after we finish recording just quickly. But I uh, just wanted to say a huge thank you and uh, really appreciate all that you put into exorcism and not just for us, but all the mentoring that you do out further afield and helping people write better code. I'm sure it is hugely appreciated uh, everywhere else. So um, thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, reach out to Gabriel if you're on exorcism, drop him a message, request some mentoring, and I'm sure you will um, have a good time with Gabriel.